Welcome everyone to ICCT's webinar on the long-term potential for increased shipping efficiency through the adoption of industry-leading practices. Uh, we're glad that you could all join us today. Uh, my name is Dan Rutherford. I'm director of ICCT's Marine and Aviation Programs. Uh, also here with me today are Drs. Haifeng Wang and Nick Lutze, who were the two authors on the white paper uh, upon which this webinar is based. Uh, before I turn things over to Haifeng and Nick, I thought I'd say a few words about uh, the webinar stru structure today. Um, Haifeng will start off with a presentation of about 30 minutes length, um, after which time we will take uh, questions uh, and um, discussion. Uh, at the moment, all of you are on mute um, in order to facilitate uh, the presentation. Um, those of you who have questions uh, can raise them in one of two ways. You can either use the chat uh, function on the GoToMeeting uh, and type in the question there. Alternatively, there's also a functionality on the GoToMeeting uh, browser by which you can raise your hand. Uh, if you do that, uh, we will come back to you, uh, time permitting, at the end of the, uh, the webinar and uh, for those questions. So again, uh, the topic of today's webinar is the long-term potential for increasing uh, in new ship efficiency. Uh, we have um, two presenters today. Uh, the first is Dr. Haifeng Wang, uh, who is a policy analyst in our marine team here at the ICCT. Uh, Haifeng's research examines the costs and benefits of energy saving and air emission mitigation measures in shipping assesses the life cycle greenhouse gases of different marine fuels, uh, and also evaluates the carbon footprint of the international supply chain. Uh, in his work, Haifeng also works closely with policymakers in the US, China, and Europe on regional clean shipping and ports initiatives. Haifeng received his PhD in marine policy from the University of Delaware, and is currently working on MBA degree at the University of Virginia. Also with us today is Dr. Nick Lutze, who is ICCT's Program Director for Fuels and Heavy-Duty Vehicles, and also the Emeritus Director of the Marine Program. Uh, Nick will be um, helping answer questions today, uh, specifically those questions that are typed into the chat window. Uh, so you may not hear from him, but he is helping us out. Uh, Nick has co-authored uh, more than 18 peer-reviewed peer journal articles and dozens of reports on technology potential, regulatory design, industry compliance, and cost effectiveness for vehicles and alternative fuels. Uh, Nick worked very closely with the California Air Resources Board in the regulatory development and technical analysis towards California's 2004 and 2012 greenhouse gas emission regulations for automobiles. Uh, he received his PhD in transportation technology and policy from the University of California at Davis. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Haifeng for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, good, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Haifeng Wang. Uh, I'm working for the Marine Team at the International Council on Clean Transportation. It's my great pleasure to be here to share with you our research on long-term potential for increased shipping efficiency through the adoption of industry-leading practices. I will start my presentation with a broad context of the climate impact of international shipping, uh, including the carbon intensity and ship activity. I will focus my presentation on global in-use ship efficiency assessment. That will include methodology and data, as well as some key findings of our research. I will conclude my presentation with a high-level summary and a review of next steps. Some background. Ocean going vessels, uh, as, as you know, are the most energy efficient transportation mode in the world. For this research, actually, the heavy duty vehicle team and aviation team 
help us calculate it, the uh, C gram, uh, gram CO2 per ton mile for heavy duty trucks and aircrafts and the compared weather shifts. Uh, we found out that, not surprisingly, the energy uh, the ships are far more efficient than heavy duty trucks and aircraft. It's on par with air emissions for the rail. However, from the from another perspective, shipping accounts for over half of international freight. It provides about 14 trillion uh, ton miles of transportation supply. As a result, shipping is uh, the third largest greenhouse gas emitter and uh, energy consumer in the transportation sector. It provides um, following automobiles and heavy duty vehicles. However, keep in mind that there are about 1 billion cars on the road in the world, and there are only 14,000 ocean going vessels on the ocean. The International Maritime Organization predicts that the CO2 from international shipping will grow by about 150 percent to 250 percent by 2050 if no action taken. Unfortunately, there are some actions taken. In July 2011, as you know, uh, the IMO passed the Energy Efficiency Design Index, or EEDI, that mandates uh, new ships to reach a certain energy efficiency levels. More specifically, it requires new ships or larger new ships to increase energy efficiency by 10 percent by 2015, 20% 20 by 2020, and 25% by 2025. But as you all know, uh, ships have a pretty long lifetime. Uh, it can last more than 30 years. So the EEDI will slow, but not reverse, the CO2 growth from international shipping. Many technologies that can help ships to attain the EEDI can also be used to increase energy efficiency for the in-use fleet. Also, there are some operational measures that can be used to increase energy efficiency and reduce carbon intensity for the in-use fleet, such as weather routing and speed reduction. In 2011, the ICCT conducted a research examining CO2 reduction potential by using existing energy saving options. Our research shows that by 2020, about 440 million metric tons of CO2 could be reduced by using uh, existing technologies and operational measures. And about half of them could be reduced with negative cost. In other words, the revenue from saving fuel outweighs the cost of using energy saving options. Of course, that research was done before the EEDI was passed. In summary, um, the large remaining opportunities for reducing CO2 emissions in sector lies in the improvement of energy efficiency for the in-use fleet. But we also need to answer some overarching questions. First of all, we, do know, we need to know which factors that are influencing shipping efficiency. And if we know these factors, how can we quantify them? And if we can't achieve higher efficiency for the EU's fleet, we want to know what are the climate and energy implications for the industry. To answer these questions, the marine team at the ICCT embarked on a major study to assess global in-use shipping efficiency. We purchased 2011 Satellite Automatic Identification System, or SAIS. We commissioned a major study led by Dr. Smith 
uh, in University of College London, uh, pu who published report uh, assessment of shipping uh, energy efficiency using satellite AIS data. Uh, you can download this report from our website, by the way. We also uh, subscribed the Clarkson Ship in Intelligence dataset. We used uh, several publicly available datasets, such as the second IMO greenhouse gas report and the review of maritime transportation published annually by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. We also developed an in-house model called Global Shipping Fleet Turnover Model that I will return to shortly. But before that, I'd like to say a few words about the SEIS. The SEIS is installed on ship, on every ship larger than three, uh, 300 gross tonnage as required by the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea. The onboard transponder transmits signals to um, satellites from ships. And these signals contain very rich information. Message one, for example, uh, includes vessel location and speed over ground. Speed is important because we can calculate power based on speed. Vessel location is important because we, uh, we can spatially allocate uh, CO2 emissions and energy consumptions across different shipping routes. Message five is important because it has uh, more information. For example, the IMO number is important because it is a unique ship identifier, enabling us to link ships in the SCIS data with ship information at Clarkson dataset. And the Clarkson dataset, in turn, provides the design speed, power, ship age, and other information for each individual ship. With satellite AIS, uh, researcher, researchers at, uh, such as Dr. Martin uh, Ostewick at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis in Uni University of College London produced several videos. Uh, we used uh, the videos for VLCC and container ships to demonstrate here. These two videos are generated uh, from SEIS data in August 2011. And from these two videos, you can see the speed of uh, ship activities and geographical distribution of ship movements around the globe. Besides, we also create a map um, providing a snapshot a snapshot for the uh, container ship activities in 2011. In addition to SCAI DAS data, we also create a global ship, shipping fleet turnover model using data on ship population, overall ship efficiency, ship activity, and overall CO2 emissions. The model enables us to backcast ship activities and ship numbers, as well as ship efficiency um, in the past several decades. And also to forecast the fleet profile and the emissions in the next several decades. It provides us a tool uh, to analyze and project emissions on the different scenarios. With data and model, here are some findings. First of all, uh, there is a strong correlation between technical efficiency and operational efficiency. The technical efficiency is the gram CO2 per ton mile uh, as designed for each ship. And the operational efficiency is gram CO2 per ton mile or gram CO2 per TEU mile as observed from the SEIS data. We analyzed uh, technical efficiency and operational efficiency across nine different types of ships. And here we use container ship as an example. 
not surprisingly, the higher of a ship for their uh, operational efficiency, uh, technical efficiency, the higher for its operational efficiency. But the huge variation of the operational efficiency uh, demonstrates that there are other factors that are important, but beyond technical efficiency. One of these factors is ship age. For the newest container ships, uh, 2011 container ships, they are about 28% more efficient than industry average. For 2010 container ships, they are about 23% more efficient than the industry average. But for uh, ships that are 15 years or older, these container ships are about 22% less efficient than the industry average. Ship age and speed are important too. As you expect, largest container ships have highest operational efficiency. At the same time, these large container ships are more likely to slow steaming. On average, largest container ships operate at 76% of their design speed. But for smaller ships, they operate at about 81% of their design speed. We then compared uh, our research, uh, which used 2011 data, with IMO's research, which used 2000, uh, 2007 data. And we have some interesting findings as well here. For the technical efficiency across all nine ship, uh, all nine, uh, ship types, the uh, technical efficiency improved for all of them in 2011 compared with 2007. The same is true for speed. All nine ship types slowed their speed in 2011 compared with 2007. However, despite, despite the fact that um, ships are more efficient as designed and they operate at slower speed, the crew tankers and the general cargoes, their operational efficiency barely changed. But for the draw, dry bulk and the container ships, their operational efficiency significantly improved. We also look at the top 5% leader in terms of energy efficiency across each of the nine different types of ships. And we find out that, not surprisingly, for all nine, ship, for all nine types of ships, the 5% top performer, on average, about 50% more efficient than each of ship, uh, than each of the category, uh, than each of the nine categories of ships. That means there are some factors that are important in determining the operational efficiency, but our data cannot capture. In reviewing the uh, um, efficiency of 2011, we made a few projections under different scenarios. The EEDI scenario assumes that there's no other policies in place except for the EEDI to reduce CO2 emissions in the shipping industry by 2040. Additional technology scenario assumes that the technology that can be used to attain the EEDI are also deployed to increase energy efficiency for the EU's fleet. Additional measures scenario assumes that on top of technologies, operational measures are also applied to, re to reduce carbon intensity for the EU's fleet. The top 5% industry uh, leader scenario assumes that the, the ship industry will achieve the operational efficiency by 2040 that um, the top 5% top performer has already achieved in 2011. And we have some intriguing findings as well here. In terms of CO2 intensity, the CO2 intensity average will decline to between 9.5 gram CO2 per ton mile 
to 4.5 uh, percent, 4.2 gram CO2 per ton mile by 2040. And that will be a remarkable achievement for the industry. In consequence, the fleet-wide CO2 emissions will be reduced by between 100 million metric tons and 400 million metric tons by 2040. And under the best scenario, shipping CO2 will stabilize around 2040. And ships will see fuel by 0.9 million barrels per day to 3.2 million barrels per day by 2040. In other words, increased energy efficiency will provide a huge financial incentive for ship owners. In conclusion, shipping has been doing a remarkable job in reducing CO2 intensity and increasing energy efficiency. And we believe that the industry can continuously improve the energy efficiency in the future. There are significant variations in operational efficiency. And that difference can be partially explained by ship types, ages, and sizes. By combining SAIS data with existing data, we can get better understanding about ship operations and their operational efficiency. In the future, we plan to identify factors that are important in determining operational efficiency, but our data cannot capture. We plan to quantify these factors by collaborating with shipping companies, organizations, and other stakeholders. We also want to integrate satellite AIS data with onshore AIS data to improve data quality and have better comprehension about ship movement near the ports. Before I conclude my presentation and open the floor um, to questions, I want to ask you, my audience, some questions. Actually, these questions uh, the team at ICCT has been considering for a long time. We are wondering which measures do you think should be used to increase energy efficiency. And these measures include technologies, operational measures, or policies. We are also wondering what are the implications of a shipping carbon footprint on global supply chain, knowing that shipping has been a pillar of the globalization. We are also curious about the major opportunities in your mind for improving energy efficiency over the next three decades in international shipping. I hope that these topics will not only facilitate our discussions in the webinar, but if you have more thoughts after the webinar, please feel free to email me or contact with the Marine team. You can see uh, my contact information from this slide, and you are one click away from our, my team information from this, from this slide. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Haifeng. Um, with that, uh, we will now go into the question and answer section of the webinar. Um, I do see that we have a question uh, from Michael Tubman. Um, let me see if I can uh, unmute uh, Michael and uh, have him pose a question. Michael, are you there? So, uh, so it's uh, uh, sorry. They are. So. They're asking me the, the question. They're asking my question, but they want me to ask it. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Michael, if you're uh, able to speak, you can speak now. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, okay. Uh, I wanted to know if 
the increased use of LNG as a shipping fuel would impact any of the efficiency improvements that you've discussed in your presentation here? Yes, uh, thank you very much for your question, Michael. Uh, first of all, it's a very good question and it's a very timely question as we know that LNG has been a very important topic in the shipping industry. Um, actually, in this analysis, we did include a scenario uh, for the LNG usage um, for the shipping industry, but we did, didn't include uh, this scenario uh, in the final report. Uh, before publishing the shipping efficiency report, we published another report examining the life cycle greenhouse gas uh, emissions from liquefied natural gas and the marine fuel. And actually, you can download this report on, from our website. And uh, we look at you know, the CO2 emission reduction by using LNG as a marine fuel um, by examining eight pathways of LNG uh, to, the, to the North America. And uh, we incorporated uh, the findings of that research into this analysis. And um, about five, we think uh, about 5% reduction can be achieved uh, in a life cycle, from a life cycle perspective um, by 2040. Uh, the reason is uh, we think that uh, the greenhouse gas reduction, net greenhouse gas reduction by using LNG is not as big as we uh, expected. Uh, we think about 18% to 10% greenhouse gas reduction could be, uh, could be achieved by using LNG uh, from a life cycle perspective um, by using best practices. Uh, but again, um, you can get more information from uh, that report, uh, which is on our website. Great. Um, we have another question here, which I will read out. Um, it is from Alexander Dumas, um, and it is, what alternative operational practices are currently being contemplated? Um, and I think perhaps, Haifeng, this speaks to the range of operational practices that um, uh, you know, are either currently in effect or might be adopted in the future that perhaps our uh, SAIS-based modeling is not picking up. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for your question, um, Alexandria. Um, so the SAIS data can best, uh, best capture the slow steaming. So we can know, actually, the, the speed a ship is operating. Uh, and then compare the operational, operational speed with the design speed uh, of a ship, uh, which we can get information from the Clarkson data set. Um, and besides that, we do not know, we do, the data cannot capture other operational matters, I guess. Uh, but, um, you know, as industry practitioners will argue that there are a lot of operational matters that uh, many ship owners have has been have been using for a long time. Uh, for example, uh, ships can uh, polish uh, polish uh, the propeller or clean the house, uh, etc. And uh, there are more advanced technologies such as uh, weather routing and autopilot. Um, but um, weather I, I believe weather routing is less uh, used than uh, polishing propeller uh, because you have to. Uh, rely on the technologies, technologies that uh, can give you information about the weather and the currents uh, in your shipping route. But it's coming. Um, and um, uh, again, uh, maybe a little bit commercial here. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, there's a report in 2011 that we published uh, about uh, marginal billing cost curve for reducing greenhouse gas from shipping. Uh, there are about 20 technologies that we examine, uh, examined. About half of them are uh, operational matters and half of them are technologies. Uh, I think all of them has been used to some extent uh, by the shipping industry. Um, we have uh, another question uh, from Anant Vyas, um, somewhat uh, thought-provoking. Uh, 
and it is, uh, is there a future for residual fuel oil use in the marine sector after, uh, actually, a future for residual fuel oil after 2020, full stop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's indeed very thought-provoking, uh, and it's also a $1 million question. <laughs> um, I, I have to say that it's, it's, it's unclear. I think there's are still markets for the residual fuel after 2020, um, depending, you know, how many ships are picking up the scrubbers. And then you also have low sulfur fuel and LNG competing for the market. Um, so it's, it's really depending on, on the, on the uh, uh, ship owner's acceptance to, to scrubbers. I guess they are, you know, scrubber is a mature technology um, but, you know, but it's also new for the shipping industry. Uh, you have to, uh, um, I mean, shipping industry have to accommodate the uncertainties in using scrubbers. Again, this is very good, uh, very good, uh, very good question. Uh, we've got a pretty active crowd today. Uh, we have a question about the definition of design speed and ship types um, from Brian Wood Thomas. Um, Hi Fung, you noted that smaller ships uh, were operating at 81% of design speed and larger ships at 76% of design speed. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you identify the threshold you use to define larger ships? Uh, and also over what time period the da data was analyzed? Yeah. Oops. So first of all, the threshold of larger and smaller ships is here. Um, so the smaller, uh, smallest types of container ships is container ships that are less than 2,000 TEU. And the biggest types of container ships are those are uh, larger than 8,000. Uh, we use this definition aligning ourselves with IMO greenhouse gas report. Um, and um, to return to the design speed question, um, so the design speed, it, we, we, get, we got the design speed from the Clarkson data set, uh, which said basically ships cannot operate beyond this design speed. Uh, what other questions? Sorry, maybe I missed some. Yes, the other question was the time period over which you analyze the data. Oh, all right. Oh, sorry, um, it's 2011, because we purchased the 2011 uh, satellite AIS data. Great. Let's see. I don't immediately see any additional questions. Uh, perhaps we'll pause for about uh, 20 seconds to give people an opportunity to pose those. Um, Haifeng, while we're waiting, perhaps you can go back to your slide with the, your questions for the audience. Mm -hmm. See if yeah. we might have a discussion of that. Right. Uh, I actually do have uh, a question from Eleanor Kirtley. Um, uh, it says, um, Thank you for talking about efficiency normalized by ton nautical mile, um, but also in uh, absolute emissions considering future growth in traffic. Um, Haifeng, can you talk about the method that uh, was used to estimate ship utilization? Yes. So the uh, ship utilization is the fun part <laughs> of, this, of this research, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure Tristan, whether Tristan was online or not, but um, we indeed have some uh, uh, engaging discussions with uh, Tristan and um, um, the industry people. Um, so um, the SEIS also has a uh, ship's utilization rate uh, in the message five, uh, but this uh, utilization rate is input and uh, manually. So when, I guess when Tristan got the utilization rate, uh, as reported by the SEIS data, he was surprised, and we were surprised as well because uh, it was pretty low. Um, 
And then we talked with um, many industry people and we got uh, many advices from them. So we decided that not, we decided not use uh, the ship utilization rate as reported by the SEIS. Instead, we use the uh, utilization rate reported by the IMO greenhouse gas report. So perhaps that is a um, short answer for this question. And Haifeng, do you know off the top of your head what the ranges of ship utilization rates were by for uh, representative ships from that study? Um, I can think about 48% um, for one type of ships, <laughs> which may be useless because uh, in the in the IMO greenhouse gas report, they examined 53 types of uh, ship age, uh, ship size, and uh, type uh, combinations. But I think in the ballpark is about 40 percent to 60 percent. Okay. Uh, but again, the greenhouse, the, the second greenhouse gas report um, is free online, so um, you can download and have a look at the util utilization rate. Okay. Um, so we've addressed one other question that was raised, which was whether the in CO2 intensity in this study was based upon full vessel capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer of that apparently is no. Yes. Um, um, another question we've gotten um, is about um, your thoughts about uh, the use of transshipment facilities to make greater use of larger ships. Um, do you see any uh, role in, in policy makers and, and uh, policies to encourage this? Well, that's a little bit beyond my uh, expertise. Maybe um, I can say something, but do not believe me. <laughs> so. In my mind, I don't see. I well, the the trans tra the transshipment is a very interesting topic because um, it's really a commercial uh, decision, and uh, you know depending on the shipping companies and depending on the port strategies, um, you know, a as far as I know, uh, several ports made. Uh, in East Asia made uh, very strategic decisions to be a transshipment port. So I'm not quite sure how national or international policies will would be encouraging or in, uh, disencouraging uh, the transshipment because by the end of the day uh, it's really the financial and business decision to transship in you know, a port or not. But we I, I do think there's there would be a trend uh, in the future that uh, ships are becoming larger, uh, but not all ports can accommodate larger larger ships. So perhaps smaller ships will trans uh, transship commodities from small ports to large harbor ports, and big container ships ships pick up this uh, uh, these commodities and transport to another continent. Uh, that is very likely. But again, I guess, I guess it Great. has to uh -huh. be, uh, you know, that's really very demanding for the uh, supply chain management. Okay. Um, Haifeng, I have a, a question here regarding the uh, potential impact of overcapacity in the marine sector on the findings in the study. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, um, you know, because of the economic crisis in the time frame that you've looked at, there mm -hmm. was overcapacity. Um, and the question is, um, could this overcapacity have influenced the results of the study, for example, by um, um, acting as an incentive for slow steaming? Yes, um, that's a good question, and I, I definitely think, um, first of all, there's economic uh, recession, and then there are 
there's a flood of new ships delivered um, in 2009, 2010, uh, because uh, many ships were ordered when the international trade was was booming. So there are a huge amount of overcapacity um, in the industry, and it partially incentivizes um, this loop theming. But I think if we look beyond the overcapacity issue, um, the slew steaming is really uh, influencing the bottom line of the, of the industry. So I know there are ongoing debate about whether the slew steaming will be there uh, to stay or not in the future. But I think if we look at when slew steaming happened, uh, I think uh, as far as I know, um, the slew steaming got more attention first in 2008 when the slew, uh, when international trade was still booming and when uh, the new flood of ships has not, has yet to arrive. At that time, the main incentive for slow steaming is to reduce fuel. Um, as you know, 2008, the, the fuel price is crazy um, be, before the recession uh, took place. So at that time, many shipping lines reduced their speed to conserve fuel and to reduce cost. And this pressure will persist um, in the future when international trade uh, recover and there are less ships and more uh, international trade. So there are some uh, um, factors that will be in place, uh, you know, to come into play. Um, on one side, there's there are less uh, there are uh, less overcapacity. On the other side, there are higher uh, energy costs. So. Um, I mean, slow steaming, uh, in my mind, may not, you know, in the future ships will not, may, may not slow, uh, reduce their speed as, as big as today, but um, to some extent, slow steaming will be there because, because of the higher energy cost. I have a couple more questions here. Um, one relates the uh, assumptions used to um, compare different types of ships. For example, container ships uh, versus those types of ships that where cargo is typically measured in terms of weight. Um, so Haifeng, can, do you have a, uh, an answer to the question of um, what assumptions and data w were applied to convert between container uh, ships and um, other ship types with cargoes measured by weight? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. And thank you for clar uh, clarifying that. Um, I'm not sure who read this question, but uh, thank you for clarification. Um, for, for the container ships, we have two metrics. One is a gram CO2 per ton mile and the other one is gram CO2 per TU mile. I, I think in the, re, in the report published by uh, UCL, uh, they uh, applied a weight for the TU to convert TU to, uh, to tonnage. Um, and, and we do not specifically compare the operational efficiency for different types of ships. Uh, we put them in the same graph uh, just because we don't want to you know, show nine different uh, uh, show nine different graphs uh, for nine different type of ships, um, and we understand that uh, crew tankers and container ships have totally different commodities. So is is not that wise to compare uh, the operational efficiency for them uh, be between these two type of two types of ships, but we put them in the graph because. Uh, just for um, partly because of the uh, simplicity is not we do not make a deliberation to compare the two okay uh, I have two more questions Haifeng one um, directly related to the study and one um, um, on a somewhat different topic okay. um, um, the first is a question uh, regarding the percentage of ton miles in the study on average that are no load ton miles. And by this I'm interpreting it as essentially an empty ship. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so for this, I don't have a great answer, but I can get back to you um, after the webinar when I dig into the report and dig into the spreadsheet. Um, if you, uh, but for the, for the global average, the uh, uh, the trip of, of ballast water uh, the, and the trip of um, full container ships, all you know, all these scenarios are averaged. So uh, we we do know that in some average, uh, in some voyages, uh, ships are empty, uh, only with ballast water, uh, and uh, in some trips the ships are full uh, or ninety percent full. But then for the whole year, we average them together. So if you want to know for how many trips that are uh, full or how many trips ships are empty, uh, I have to go back to the spreadsheet and, uh, and have a count. Okay, that's a, a good question to, to take offline, I think. Um, I have, let's see, a couple more questions actually. We've got some good questions still coming in. Um, so the first relates to um, emissions rather than CO2. So I think Kaifeng, your, your, your bio at the start of the presentation um, triggered some thoughts. Um, mm. The question regards um, port policies for reducing local emissions. Mm -hmm. um, and Haifeng, can you identify any cutting edge options uh, for reducing local emissions from, uh, from ports? Oh, sure. I think that's a um, very timely question because, um, uh, as a, an, again, another small commercial, um, we are working on ports right now. So if you have good ideas, please shoot me an email. Um, it's specific on air emission and CO2 reductions for ports in the United States. Um, I guess for ports, uh, there are a lot of uh, good practices. Uh, in Port Long Beach and uh, Los Angeles, for example, they have shore power uh, for ships. They have um, electrification for uh, cargo handling equipment. They have programs to retire uh, old heavy-duty trucks. Um, and in California, they also have 40 nautical miles uh, slow steaming zone, uh, which is voluntary, by the way. And in Europe, uh, in Port of Rotterdam, uh, they are pr promoting um, uh, liquid financial gas and the marine fuel. Um, and in, for the inland water, uh, inland water retransportation, uh, both the US and the EU requires um, ultra low sulfur diesel for the inland vessels. Uh, in Asia, Hong Kong just, um, you know, Hong Kong Environmental Protection de uh, Department uh, just made a rule to require um, uh, low sulfur fuel uh, at birth, uh, it has to be uh, it has to be approved by the uh, Hong Kong uh, legislators, um, and there are also uh, voluntary uh, environmental shipping index. Uh, about 20 ports in the world um, have adopted the ESI, uh, including in the United States, including uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, in Europe, there are uh, about 18 or 16 ports that are using EXI. So, uh, and again, the, the fourth commercial, uh, if you look at our website, there is a uh, web page about a workshop that we organized in China to reduce air emissions from ships and ports. And if you look at that web page, there is a report. Um, uh, drafted by uh, Starcraft, a consulting firm, uh, for us to update the uh, IAPH um, uh, air quality toolbox. So if you look at air quality toolbox, um, there are some uh, cutting edge technologies and descriptions and costs uh, for this. And also we have a 10-pager summary you know, for that report. You can also download uh, that 10-pager uh, summary uh, from that web page as well. And if you happen to be Chinese like me, we also have a Chinese version. <laughs> Great. Um, I have one last question at this time, and I think it's um, it's a, a good sort of uh, holistic wrap-up question. 
Um, and it relates to a speech that uh, UNEP's uh, Mr. Steiner made last week, uh, in which he called upon the international shipping sector to control air pollutant emissions, citing negative health impacts from emissions of black carbon and NOx. Uh, in that speech, uh, Mr. Steiner noted that incentives were needed to drive reductions. So the question to you, Haifeng, is what incentives does the ICCT consider most promising, if any? Uh, to reduce black carbon and NOx emissions. Um, the question as I have it here is, is related to black carbon and NOx. Right, okay. Um, so I, I guess this really uh, interesting ones, and I guess for the ICCT we are uh, working on both black carbon and uh, NOx emissions. And for the black carbon, I guess, um, you know, as most of my audience know, that International Maritime Organization is considering uh, black carbon reduction in the Arctic. Um, and if, I guess if we consider, you know, the best incentive is to consider uh, and I, I guess the best incentive is to let technology and um, the, let the technology to speak and let the best practice to speak at the IMO level uh, so that policymakers can consider the cutting, uh, cutting edge uh, technologies to define and to measure uh, the, the black carbon. Uh, actually, ICCT just uh, finished uh, in collaboration with CARB and University of College, uh, University of California at Riverside to test the black carbon reduction um, uh, based on different types of fuels, not, not fuels, but based on scrubbers and uh, different uh, engine types. And we hope that uh, this information will provide, um, um, will be helpful uh, for policymakers uh, at the international level to consider re reducing um, black carbon emissions. And for, for the NOx, I guess, uh, maybe you know uh, that uh, last year, or no, actually um, several months ago, uh, the IMO is, uh, was um, proposing to postpone the Tier 3 standard at the ECA by five years. Um, I guess, you know, from from our perspective, um, this po the, this delay uh, may not be in the interest best interest of uh, uh, creating certainty uh, for the industry, uh, and also may not be the best uh, policy to incentivize technology providers and shipping companies to prepare uh, for future regulations. Great. Um, I do not see any additional questions sent by chat, and I do not see any hands raised. Um, so, um, given the time, um, we can, um, looking at um, your slide, Haifeng, mm -hmm. you had raised three questions. Um, I think we have enough time if there is anyone in the audience um, who would like to try and address any of these questions. I think we'd have a little bit of time to discuss those. So we'll pause here for about 20 seconds and see if anyone jumps in. Otherwise, uh, uh, I think we can bring things to a close. I don't see um, any hands up or anyone asking for the mic. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for um, joining us uh, for today's webinar. We thought it was a, a very stimulating discussion from our side. Um, a few notes as we close. Um, 
the recording of this webinar should be up on our website uh, within the next several days. And Haifeng, I think you will also be making the presentation slides themselves available. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, and one additional plug, um, although the date has not been set, um, those of you who are also interested in aviation uh, may like to know that we will be doing a webinar uh, within the next several weeks related to a similar report that we've done on aviation uh, in-use efficiency, airline efficiency. Um, so you can um, look at our website and uh, we should be providing information about scheduling for that webinar in the near future. Uh, with that, um, I would like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today and thank, thanks also to uh, Haifeng and Nick uh, for their presentation of, of the study.